Welcome everybody. It's, it's women's afternoon and this is a session I'm looking so extremely forward to and you know why? Because it's important that we as the women international community in film uh, gather sometimes and for that reason we have invited one of my very dear friends and a professional you don't want to know Deborah Zimmerman. Deborah Zimmerman of Women Make Movies which was already founded in New York in 1972 so that's really really old. I have a slight small anecdote and because we're in the Netherlands it's about the bike it's about a red bike it's about Deborah. Say, I know that you have been uh, cycling through one specific road. There was the Women Make Movies uh, office, like, and that you were an intern when you were really, really young. Yeah, you're laughing, but I know those stories, you know, I know you. And that was your start. It was the second feministic movement. And I think you thought, not you, the movement thought, it was really, really important that the role of women in front and behind the camera should be emphasized, should be explored. And to know all about that, um, we're having a fantastic conversation for, well, sort of half an hour. Then Beri Shemashi comes in because she's an extremely good moderator and we open up the floor to the panel. The good news is for all the women listening um, that um, you can ask questions in the chat and as much as I can, we will uh, include them, of course. Um, Deb, how are you today? Oh, you have to unmute, darling. Yes. Deb and me are, are, are miracles. We were the magicians of technicians, so sometimes <laughs> we need to help each other slightly a little bit. I'm fine. I'm going to confess and tell everybody that I am a little bit not myself because I've really just recovered from COVID and I, I can use the COVID card that I have a little bit of COVID brain. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just so busy and crazy right now. So I'm going to be very funny today. I know. And, um, well, you're always very funny. I thought it would be a really good idea just to give everybody who's listening an impression of the work you have been doing and I know there's a really beautiful clip shall we show that first and have a look at the clip so if we could play the clip of movies that ma uh, movies that matter <laughs> women made movies of course please if I actually oh, if, if I could just say this is a it's a bit old um but as Maria said we just wanted to give you an idea of the kinds of works that that we're working with Brilliant. So we see the, the clip, please. That's so impressive and so many titles. I mean, I know quite a few of the films. I saw so many amazing titles, etc. You see, you see passing by winning big prizes and so on. And you know what? I have to share an anecdote. And on that anecdote, maybe Deborah, you can take on to take us what women in movies that women women made movies. My <laughs> God, I'm confusing the two constantly, but this is so stupid. Um, what it really means. It was a while ago, it was in 2000 and 
18, I think, we were together at the Zarajevo Film Festival and we were with a, quite a crowd of people having a dinner, a few male, male colleagues, and one person asked, so Deborah, are you getting not a little bit outdated with your company? Is it really still necessary? I mean, there's so many women filmmakers. There's, I mean, we, we, we're there, isn't it? And then Deborah said, let me fill you in. And she made a statement I will never forget. And I thought, no, I don't think it's equal already. I don't think all the women have the same chances as men are having. Do you recall that, Deb? Do you recall yeah. that? That's, yeah. yeah. You know, I forgot it when you first mentioned it to me a couple of days ago. But now when you said it, I remember exactly the tone of the voice. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting because I have to tell you that I remember having this, I'm going to tell a story that I just remembered, and it was even more years ago. Um, and I happened to have been with a couple of people from IDVA, actually, uh, in um, Adelaide, when the Australian International Documentary Conference was still happening in Adelaide. So that for yeah. those of you in the industry, you know how long ago that was, more than 10 years ago, when Christoph Jorg was still a commissioning editor, and Thomas Balmes had just made a uh, I don't know if he'd made babies yet. Um, but anyway, um, we were on the beach and Tomas looked at me and he said, you know, I just don't think that women's film festivals are very important. I don't think, I think, you know, if women made good films, they wouldn't have to show in women's film festivals. And I looked at him and I said, well, that's so interesting, Thomas. So I guess if you made good films, your films wouldn't have to show in documentary film festivals. And he kind of looked at me like, Ugh. and Christoph Jörg also said something to me that year about the fact that we were kind of, isn't it a little bit, you know, old? And this is more than 10 years ago. Um, so unfortunately, it isn't old. And unfortunately, the statistics are still really, really, really not good. Um, although there's been unbelievable successes. And I have to say that I've been doing this since 1983. It was actually about 1978 when I rode my bicycle, as you were saying, Maria, in front of the Women Make Movies office. For three months, I rode my bike in front of the office because I wanted so much to work with this organization, um, which was founded in 1972 by uh, two really incredible women, um, Ariel Dougherty and Sheila Page. Um, but really, for all that time, people have been saying, it's gotten better, it's gotten better. And I can finally say that it has. In the last three years, and I think really Oscar So White was a really big impetus and Time's Up also, um, mm -hmm. and the Me Too movement, all of these things kind of came together and we have seen a real shift, but I wanna just share some statistics with- yeah. uh, So this is good to know. Here. Yeah, uh, to go back to history and what, what then got better, yeah. Yeah, where are we coming what from? What reality? Yes, what the reality? Yeah. What the reality is? And forgive me if I'm really bad te technically, because I am. But no, I'm worse. I'm for for definite worse. So let's it's okay. see if it works. But I you're going to share uh, your screen with us and yeah, just, There we yeah. go. Yeah. So, um, uh, but this is not the one I wanted to start with. That's okay. No, but it's really Here taking us back back in time. Yeah. So this is how great it is for women. There were 12 female directors working uh, on the 100 top grossing films in 2019. So this is great. And only and top grossing, you mean best in the world. That's mean meaning, that, meaning making the most amount of money in Hollywood. So this is really the commercial industry. And okay. I'm going to show you statistics from the, mostly from the commercial industry. But of course, the commercial industry reflects what's going on in, in the world. Sure. Um, okay. Yep. Okay, and four of those films were by women of color. So if you're a woman of color, your chances of making a, a film that's, that is making money is really, really, really slim. And your chances are, are a little bit better than one in 10. And I'll also tell you that for 30 years now, I've been going all over the world and I've been talking about women in film. And for some reason, that one in 10 figure has just continued and continued and continued. It is better, you'll see statistically, but when I saw this number 12, and this is 2019. And by the yeah. way, I think we were in Sarajevo in 2018, not uh, yeah. 2019, no, not 18, 2018. 
Um, okay, so that's just one little statistic. Uh, and 26 out of 40 film slates from eight companies, the largest companies in Hollywood, did not even include one underrepresented woman director. Of course, that makes sense. And underrepresented, of course, are, are women, excuse me, women of color. Hmm. Um, this just gives you an idea of how it was in 2017 uh, for underrepresented directors. And that's not just women. Um, thir overall, 13%. <laughs> uh, the gender gap, this is the awards um, that women have won. 3.2% at the Academy Awards for directors. Of course, this year we're really excited because Chloe Zhang is, uh, and Emil Fennell is, are up for up for awards, which is great and fantastic. But again, we still have to look at the reality that 5% of the Best Director nominees from 2008 to 2020 were female, 94% were male. Okay. Um, and of course, it's not different in the, in the other awards categories. Um, here's what happens uh, in terms of, of pipeline. Oh, so this is part of this thing of everybody saying that, oh, but it's better, you know, it's bad in Hollywood, but it's getting better in TV and it's better on the platforms. And Netflix has been, been making a really big statement about how they are really working on, you know, the gender gap. And if you look at the percentages, and by the way, all of these statistics come from the USC Annenberg, which is um, the University of Southern California. It's an amazing woman named Stacy Smith, who's been doing incredible work on uh, statistics for on women in the industry. Um, and you know, it's really only about seven years something that she's been doing this, but these statistics have been so important in actually helping to make change. And again- You need to measure, huh? You need to measure. Yeah, it's really, really important. Um, yeah. uh, and actually this is not good because this is the most recent statistic is that there is a 30% percentage drop um, yeah. Yeah. between top grossing films and narrative films. Um, yeah. Okay, the next one, let's see. This is just to show you distributors again. It's just a visual representation, you know, like eight directors out of 192 from 20th Century Fox, you know, four from out of 123 from Lionsgate, um, 11 of 211 from Sony. Um, so of all the films that, that got released last year in Hollywood, 70 out of 1,448 were by women or women directors. Um, and then this is important because we have to think about why is it important that there are women filmmakers behind the screen? And it has to do with what we're seeing on the screen. And for me at this point, that's becoming increasingly important because what we're seeing consistently is that two of three characters that we see on screen are men, which means that men. only men, only a third of the characters that you see are women. I mean, that is just really, really crazy. Only 12% of 1200 films in 2019 had a balanced cast, meaning that there was as many films, um, many women as men. And then you have whether or not they even have female speaking characters. I mean, look at these numbers. You know, I, I just, to me, it's unbelievable. That means that women only speak one third of the time. So if we're speaking about women having a voice, if we're speaking about women's issues being addressed, how can they be if, there's, if we have no agency, if we have no, if we have no voice? And Deborah, this, this, this are actually American. This yes, is I'm like, sorry. Yes, 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 yes. I'm sorry. I, you know, in I, the United States. Generally, yeah. I generally don't just do things about the U.S., but I was doing something no, very quickly. Fine. And this is the newest report that came out. Um, okay. So I'm gonna. I think I'm just gonna finish this, and I'm gonna go. You see my New York screen, and then. Uh, uh, this is again the, 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 the platform. And by the way, this is the Sundance competition. So even they say that Sundance is kind of the best of the, of the bigger festivals, it's still only 34%, which is basically a little bit more than one third or one third mm -hmm. of, the, of the films are by women directors in competition, which of course we know is really, really important. Yeah. Um, that's an old slide. So I'm just going to finish with this in terms of the slides. And this is the, this is the whole idea of it's so much better in documentary than it is in narrative. Um, really? 
fantastic documentary filmmaker named Don Porter, who said at a keynote a couple of years ago, um, yes, uh, it's better than in documentary, but it is better than horrible. Better than horrible is still horrible. Um, and what you see on this side is the number of women working in independent films. So this is the director uh, and these are the years. So you see it's gotten better since 2008 from 22 to 38 percent, which is which is really not it's not terrible. But it, is it what we want? Is it the time when women make movies should go out of business because we are we're inching up towards even something close to half and half? I mean, what about the idea that we could make 60% of the films um, rather than 50% of the films? What a concept. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look, you know, cinematographers, 16% of the cinematographers are women. Yeah. Um, in documentary, they're 19%. So little. You know, editors, everybody says that editors, you know, editors are supposedly was a place where women had so much opportunity because they were behind the scenes. And it was always said that like, you know, editing was like sewing, so women used their hands. Mm -hmm. Look at those numbers. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. That's really, really nuts. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so that's, that's, that's really the, well, the, the very important. My statistics. Yeah, uh, well, that, yeah. I'm gonna that's, stop there, there we go. That's really amazing to see and also a bit shocking to be real honest because what will it then be worldwide? We don't know. But 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 you made also a statement saying actually our mission statement at Women Make Moves, uh, it hasn't changed. And that's that's then right. That's true. That's true. And I do want to say something about, about um, all over the world because yeah. I didn't show you, but um, there's an amazing <laughs> slide that I have about the Cannes Film Festival about um, Berlin and about Toronto. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it says Venice, Venice, Berlin, Cannes, and yeah. And basically, you know, even after they signed the pledge of 50-50, which of course is a really important initiative that I think Bridget could certainly talk about it later. Um, you know, it was, it was started here in Europe, I think. Um, and it, it is really an amazing concept that we want 50-50 by 2020. Of course, now we're in 21 and all these festivals signed on to this, to this concept. Berlin had eight out of 17 women, no, was it eight out of, no, eight out of 21 women directors after they signed uh, the 50-50 pledge. Um, Venice was, horrific even after they signed the 50 50 mm -hmm. pledge and can of course is unfortunately the worst of them all um and i'm sorry i don't have those actual numbers in front of me but trust me they were not were not good at all um mm -hmm. and if we look beyond europe the western world um in fact some of the most exciting things that are going on in terms of women organizing and networking and getting together are in the global south. Um, I was meeting with filmmakers at the Elguna Film Festival in Egypt uh, last year. And there's an amazing group of Middle Eastern women filmmakers that are getting yeah. together to start saying, we really need more. We need more funding. We need more place in festivals. We need more resources in general. We need support. Um, and that is mirrored by women really all over the world, um, mm -hmm. which, is, which is also, um, a really, really exciting development post Me Too, post Oscar So White and post Time's Up. Um, in the US, there's a group called Brown Girls Doc Mafia. Um, for the, and it's been an incredible force within the documentary community. Um, and it's one of a number of initiatives, many, many initiatives created by women of color to really try to look at how can women of color get a bigger piece of the pie. Because, you know, I talk about numbers and I am a bean counter, but we really, again, have to think about what is the impact and the result of those numbers. You know, it's really about opportunity. You know, yeah, and, and, yeah, and, and you, I know, I know that you, that you always had diversity and inclusive from the very, very beginning. And I mean, I, I, I know that for a, a lot of women filmmakers to do, when we both have been traveling around the world, you are like an icon to them to and, and a motivation and a help. But 
what are your what are your tools? What is your toolkit in order to? <laughs> I mean, I know you get over 300 uh, 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 proposals per year, and you can only take on 20, 25. So a lot of them drop out, and they are not that lucky that they can be nurtured by you or by the company. And so, so how? What is your take on that? What 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 can we together as an international women film community then mean if it's still this low, so to speak. Yeah, you know, that's it's a really, that's a really, really good point. And I want to go backwards and then I'll go forward. You know, I want to yeah. just speak for a second about self-representation because this okay. is such an important issue. Um, and it's true that women make movies for many reasons has been committed since the 1980s, very, in fact, since the beginning of the organization, very deeply um, into, diverse representation back in the day when we called it multicultural. And I have to say that I think we got a lot of, um, I don't know what the right word is, but let's just say similar kind of comments to the ones that I got in Sarajevo were like, you know, do you really have to be so strict about this? Do you really have to have diverse voices? And I have to say we stuck to it. And, and now I feel like the rest of the world is kind of caught up. Um, and it's great. And it's taken this huge Black Lives Matter movement, I think, to really push the, push the needle. Um, but it? we always felt that if you're going to talk about women representing themselves, you have to talk about Black women representing themselves. You have to talk about the South being able to speak for themselves. And that we've always seen part of our mission at Women Make Movies to bring those voices to the US, to really help to educate US audiences about what women's lives really are like around the world. Um, so that whole notion is important. And you know, one of the things that I think is, is and I, I will go back to what we can do, but before I get there, you know, one of the issues that I think is so important right now has to do with even if women are getting opportunity behind the camera and we saw that it's not as much as it needs to be, mm -hmm. what ends, the films that end up getting funding and the films that end up getting the big budgets, and I'm speaking now in terms of documentary um, mm -hmm. and in terms of independent narrative films mm -hmm. are not films in which women are the main characters. They're not films that are really about women's issues. And I'm speaking about the human rights community as well as the, uh, how, the independent film industry, um, as well as it's really threaded throughout. And I really would like somebody to do an analysis of the budgets, because when I look at those really big documentary budgets, and I was looking at the, at the history of the Academy Awards, um, thinking about what I was going to talk about today, and there's only been two films ever that have been made by women that are about women that have won the Academy Award. And one of them was Frida Mock's film, Maya Lin, and the other one, um, oh gosh, now I'm forgetting it. Uh, uh, what was the other one? Oh. Well, you think because I have oh, a born, born into brothels, born into brothels, ah, born into brothels, born into brothels. Yeah. by Zana Bristi, yeah. which was made. Of so course. there's because you feel like when when I was doing the program for our festival, now we had some we have some amazing films on women by women, fly so far, mothers, world premiere of dying to divorce, where, where women filmmakers making films. So you think, okay, we're good, but we are of course in that respect, as human rights more niche. But I've got a question from a filmmaker I know from Turkey, and she's asking the. What do you think about the relation between these stats and quality standards expected from women filmmakers? <laughs> Are we women more harshly judged? That's a very interesting question, I personally think. I have a wonderful anecdote. Yes, we are. And in fact, we, we are. are. But we also, yes, we are judged more harshly. Absolutely. And part of the problem mm -hmm. is that, <laughs> once again, two of three critics, film critics, are men. So we're constantly being judged by men. I mean, of course, we all know that the, that the film industry as a whole is, is made up primarily of men, a majority of men. Um, but I will tell you a story that I was in um, Bulgaria uh, before the pandemic, and I was on a panel about women's film festivals, and some guy, um, actually, I think, I won't, I won't name names. No, nee, don't name, don't name. Yeah. Anyway. A festival director said, I would really love to show films by women, but the films just aren't good enough. I'm sorry, I have to say this. The films are not good enough. And I loved it because these two guys from, uh, where was it, Georgia, I think, maybe, or Romania? 
<laughs> from from the Balkans, I believe. I'm pretty sure it was the Balkans. Um, or Eastern Europe, but yeah, the Balkans stood up and said, well, we are running a, oh, it's from Kosovo. They were from Kosovo. We are running a film festival and we have 50% films by women and they are excellent films. And I loved, and they said to him, you're crazy, you know, look harder. Just, you well, know. That, that's also the thing. I mean, yeah. That's also the thing. It's also where you look for. It's also where you, not only where you put your lens, but it, I know that you, you, that's a statement you made as well, like, like 80, 90% of the film directors are men and that's maybe they look differently than we do. I mean, we, we hear it moves up man to do both women and men, of course, but there's a lot of women, fantastic films. And I've been moderating so many sessions with women direct, actually one from Kosovo who, who had a mind blowing film, feature films, a, a fiction film. It's that's not not really really happening, and and how do you then? I mean, as I understand, you you make the film stronger or want to help the film. You do production, you do distribution, yeah. and and how can you elaborate yeah. a little bit on how you then help the filmmakers within the yeah. state? But as I know from all over the world, that's Absolutely. why you travel so much. You 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 try to help filmmakers from wherever. So could yeah. you maybe guide us a bit to that direction? Yeah, I mean, I you know, actually, and I will I will speak about films that are in your festival because they're really indicative of the work that we've been doing. Um, so first of all, we do have two programs. One is a production assistance program, and the other is distribution. That's and in production I mean. assistance, we're working with filmmakers, primarily American filmmakers, because the um, the huge benefit for the program has been a tax advantage that Americans can get. But slowly we're, we are bringing on more international filmmakers in order for them to really work within the program. We need to teach them how to work, how to be, um, how to be able to get funding from US funders. But two of the films that we have in the festival, The Mole Agent, uh, Maite Alberti, she, not that film, but we started working with her in our first film, giving her access to US funders. Um, Once Upon a Time in Venezuela is another film. Yep. Um, Annabelle Rodriguez, that we started working with her on that film very, very early on when she got her very first grant from Tribeca um, and have worked with her throughout looking at rough cuts, cuts, making recommendations to funders, um, trying to open up doors. And I think that that's really our big role is what I call in helping women to get into the pipeline. You know, yeah. unfortunately we know. And what is the pipeline for you? What well, is the, how would you yeah. define the pipeline? Yeah, I mean, you know, the pipeline is unfortunately, um, it's the way that you get to get your film made. It has to do with the people that you're able to meet, the doors that get open to you, the funding that you get access, that you have access to. Yeah. And in order for that to happen, it's a very, very rare film that comes out of nowhere and is able to garner that kind of support and those kinds of funds. Um, mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to start someplace and that the place where you start is the place that leads you into uh, that pipeline. Um, Another film that we have in the festival is, and the film that we're distributing, so I can talk about our distribution program. Um, and I will just say that we do have 300 films in the production assistance program at any given time in various <laughs> stages of production and completion. Um, the film that, that we're working with right now that came out of the program uh, is a film called Coded Bias, which you're showing, yep. um, which is a very important film about sure. uh, the bias within artificial intelligence. Um, and I actually met, uh, we worked with Shalini, the filmmaker on her, again, her first film it was called A Drop of Life many, many years ago. Uh, then she went on doing many other things. And I re, uh, re-met her at, at CPH Docs when she was pitching this film. And we started working with her on it. Mm. Meaning that we, in this case, she was a more, much more experienced filmmaker than Annabelle was. She didn't need as much support um, as, Annabelle did, but what we were able to do is to give her, give her our nonprofit status to make it possible mm. for her to get grants from different foundations. And I want to mention Coded Bias in another way because I think it's also really important. When we talk about films that are about women as well as by women, for me, Coded Bias is a really brilliant example of that because the issue is not only affecting women. 
The issue affects men and women. But if you look at that film, almost every single expert in the film is a woman. It's completely reversed to almost all of the other films which are about technology. Um, you know, there's been two or three films that have been made in the last year. This is the absolute opposite of that. Um, yeah, yeah and it's she really contra, right? Yeah. Yeah, she really turns the table on that and makes you think about, again, who is the one who's doing the speaking? Um, and we're really, we're really proud of that film. And we're very happy that it's available on Netflix all over the world. Um, it's been a, a huge, huge success. But not every film that we distribute is going to be, you know, is going to have that kind of budget, is going to get represented by Synetic, is going to be sold to people. Yeah, I was about and, to go that direction, actually. To, yeah. yeah, and yeah. to uh, yeah. and to Netflix. We work with a lot of first time directors and yeah. we see ourselves in many ways as the pipeline. You know, we worked with Lena Dunham on her very, very first film. We worked with Jans Ford, um, who made, uh, who's the first trans, transsexual to be nominated for an, for an Academy Award for a documentary. Um, we worked with just so many, many women. Gurinder Chadha, who's a you know filmmaker from England, Asian filmmaker from England, who made Bend It Like Beckham, and now is doing some really big series on television. But but Deb, if I if, yeah. if I hear you talking, yeah, right. and I like I'm I'm from some faraway place, but I can't reach you. So mm -hmm. I'm I, I'm not pretty sure if I'm with my film and my film idea get even to those 300 uh, send alone to the the 25 you can um, that we can just can, and yeah. we will we we'll open the floor in a, in a bit and Berry will moderate with the other women like how can we then help each other but if you could have before we 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 bring uh, uh, Berry to our our discussion and talk with the three for for a short while. Uh, what we should be uh, asking the panel and where should the direction be going. I'm just curious. So how will it for women from all over the world? I mean, you have been in all these places who cannot go to, to women make movies and cannot yes. be guided by you. What, what, sh what is your advice? As a well, first of all, they can be <laughs> not everybody, but I just want to say because I think that that people, well, and I want women in particular to be taking advantage of the situation that we have right now of yeah. of COVID. Believe it or not, you know, there are all of these pitching forums all over. Europe, all over the world, which you don't have to spend all this money. You don't have to travel to get there. You can just submit your film. You can pay whatever small fee or no fee that they have. And you can get access to all of these decision makers yeah. um, at in a way that, and by the way, the decision makers are doing men like myself and you, Maria, are doing so many more meetings because it's hard to say no when people yeah. are asking you to just spend a couple of hours in your living room <laughs> talking to people on the phone rather than traveling to another country. Yeah, so do, do, do take advantage of that. But are you, yes, yeah. sir, go, go. No, go ahead. What? No, I was thinking, so um, what Egin was saying in the, in the, in the question, like we get judged maybe more harshly, but it's also, we have to make ourselves known with our projects, believe in it, sell it. And if I'm not that good of a yeah. seller, then, then, you know, I, I'm just a good filmmaker, but I'm not, not that kind of person. Right. And I have to find somebody who is my, uh, unkindly said, my vehicle to this world, you mean to say as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, I mean, I actually, I tell this to people, believe it or not, everybody thinks of me as this really, really outgoing person. I actually am one of these introverts that's actually really liked being home for the last two years or whatever. Um, and I don't like talking to people that I don't know if I don't have a reason to talk to them. I can't make a cold call if you like, in fact, I think I, I, I think I developed Women Make Movies or I didn't found it, but I think I developed it as an earned income organization because I can't ask people for money. So I'm one of those people, you know, mm. but I always have a sidekick that can, you know, <laughs> I went to a film festival in, North Carolina full frame. I really wanted this film called Private Violence. It had been at Sundance and it was a fantastic film. And I went to the party that the filmmaker was having for her, for her premiere. And I brought my cousin with me because my cousin can talk to anybody. And she met the husband of the filmmaker within two minutes of being at the party and introduced me to the filmmaker. 
So okay. you got to use what you have, you know, you have a friend, bring that friend, get a producer, get a producer. Yeah, and make your, and let yourself be helped by it. Yeah, yeah. It's really, really important. And I just want to say one other thing. Yeah, go. And, this, and then we, and then I really uh, want yes. to ask no. Biri on the floor. Yeah, go. This is a great intro into, I think, what everybody else is going to be talking about. We are our best friends. Filmmakers are... Mm -hmm actually so much more generous than anybody thinks that they are in terms of helping each other, in terms of networking. <laughs> We need to be those people. And, you know, too often I see at pitching forums, women pitching by themselves. You never see men pitching by themselves. They always have a producer with them, right? So we need, to, we need to work together. And the women that we're going to be talking to now are all part of, of those kinds of initiatives that are really helping us to do that. Um, or have experience doing that. Yeah, so, so I think this is a very good moment to bring one of those women in. Bishy Marshi, who will be uh, our moderator for the panel, who is an amazingly good journalist. We worked on a very important film of herself together, a platform. So Beri, you're with us now, right? Hi, hello. Hi, everyone. Hello. So what, 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 what is your take on the last... 35 minutes what was it something like that's i'm gonna take away with me or you want deb and um, deborah me to give you a, a direction or did you find your direction um deborah first of all thank you for this knowledge sharing and for all the facts that uh, support the knowledge you share it's always good to be hit in the face with those numbers <laughs> um so i think we have a good backing for everything we're going to talk about with that, and we have uh, people here like Wilhelmine Sanders, who's doing this uh, kind of research in the Netherlands right now. So we can dive into numbers pretty soon, hopefully. Um, what really stuck with me, uh, Deborah, was what you mentioned about agency and voice. And now these are words that we've maybe spoken about a lot for the past couple of years. But with the strong women we have in the room today, I think we can build um, gates in the pipeline for the pipe not to get too narrow for some of us to fit through uh, in development or mm. towards production. Mm. So I think that's a good visual to keep in mind. Um, it's one thing to find people like you and to find the right forms and platforms. And then how do you walk through that pipe? Uh, yeah. What are the obstacles um, on the way to an actual film? For me, that would be a nice way to look at this, also because of all the experts we have. And yeah. I don't know, Margie, Deborah, maybe you have. Uh, no, I think it's a it's a very very good way. What do you think, Deb? That's a very good way, Deborah. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I would like to hear from some of the other people on the panel and how they are actually making some of those things happen. Um, because I do think that, um, you know, there are so many different ways of threading that needle. You know, there's so many different things that we can do. You know, what I've seen in the last year is so many more mentorship programs. And I think that we've all, we all know how important mentoring is. Um, we need somebody to help open up those doors for us. Um, so, but I think I've spoken so much. I really want to just kind of pass on the torch. And I think, I think that now yeah, that's Mariana Mariana and from two ladies in blue are gonna, gonna disappear a bit. And yeah. I leave the floor to you, Beri, and we will uh, listening and coming back at the end. So please. over to you, Beri. Yes, thank you so much. And please uh, think with us and um, it, visualize the pipe and how it narrows for women as soon as women walk in and how it becomes like an ocean when men try to go through compared to women so keep that in mind and i would like to hear your thoughts if you can stay with us at the end of this conversation um i have the honor to introduce biljana tutorov circle women doc executive i oh my god can you help me biljana can you help me pronounce it <laughs> accelerate <laughs> It's you accelerated, see? but it can be anything. It's not so important. It's no, important. it's very important. This is exactly where we have to uh, help each other. Um, 
and not be like, oh, this is not important. We're really honored to have you here. I'm just quickly going to say everyone's name so you know who's in the room. We have Willemien Sanders, lecturer at Universiteit Utrecht, Department of Media Studies, at Media and Cultural Studies. We have Bridget O'Shea, founder of Documentary Association of Europe. And we have Iris Lammertsma, CEO of WIT Film and head of Vrouwen in Beeld, which is a new organization in the Netherlands. Thank you all for being here. Um, Biljana, because I, I made a little mistake in pronouncing your organization, maybe you can elaborate a bit um, <laughs> so I won't make that mistake again. Circle well. Women Doc Accelerator. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is that the circle is really the important word in our name. And the other important thing is that it's really a filmmaker's initiative that appeared without any big strategy. And thankfully, Bridget was there in uh, Doc Leipzig industry at the time. And basically, uh, Bridget is a founding member also of uh, our program or platform or training initiative. And we thought spontaneously and slowly its way through. But the original idea, and maybe this explains why it appeared in Balkans and not in Belgrade, but more in, in the pro, in, in province of, uh, of our region, is that we, we felt so lonely. And uh, we felt that um, like, as filmmakers, we spend so much time alone and uh, often is in misunderstanding and not often accompanied well. And the idea was to open a space where we can have a cell of six, seven, eight, ten women that uh, have a common interest at that time and can work on each other's projects. So this, that was really the, the starting point. And uh, this is something we try to preserve that it's a uh, place where we really try to respond to everybody's need so how big is the circle um, now so now we are about to launch the fourth edition and we never thought there would be any editions it, it just started first time and then also i should uh, mention eva and alessia sonaglioni that was a second founding member that supported the, the initiative so it gets more official now we are gonna go, we are starting a fourth edition and it will be around 10 participants we are at the end of selection process it's a kind of region based but it's really european with uh, some extra european yes. projects um, so basically we are we are globally open we decided to not to close the doors to anybody, which is more complicated uh, for, uh, for funding, finding funding for the program. Um, so we're still very based on solidarity and we work with, with a very, very, very small budgets. And uh, very quickly we realized that uh, the needs we have are not typical to Balkans. We received a lot of applications from developed countries and we saw that uh, women across borders, at least in Europe and broader, uh, confront the same problems that go from lack of confidence to needing a space to, to, to work together, needing advice, etc. So, Juliana, um, so, I want, we I want are, to come back to you to talk about uh, how we can support each other and people not being their own producer and maybe pushing each other into excellence by uh, helping from the start. I feel like there's something there in your circle that we can benefit from. Uh, thank you for this introduction. Uh, I'm gonna go to Willemien Sanders. Um, was I correct about your current research? What are you diving into? Um we are looking at, with a team, at um, the number of men and women employed in Dutch film. We're looking at feature films, documentaries, and television drama, and we're collecting data. And I would like to stress the importance of collecting data, which Deborah actually also did, in order to quantify and aggregate individual experience that many women have, but many women in different roles, in different functions, uh, behind and in front of the screen. 
Um, and it's, it's necessary to collect those and aggregate, aggregate those uh, experiences and put them um, or transform them into data, uh, analyze them so that we have something to base our claims on. Because indeed, the general feeling is that in the Netherlands, uh, things are not so bad, we're progressing. But if you look at the numbers, um, we are progressing, but not as much as we would like to and as much as we should. So in that respect, um, the situation here kind of mirrors what, what Deborah uh, presented. Um, and we did a little pilot a year, about a year ago, uh, which showed that um, only in, uh, in acting, so in, in, in performance, uh, there is some parity. Uh, women take up between, let's say, or around 42% of the, of the roles, both in leading roles and supporting cast. Uh, but other roles uh, in front of and behind the camera are just, are just, uh, are just um, women are just a, a huge minority. So, so it is necessary to dive deeper into that. And 42% already sounds better than uh, the figures we just heard from uh, the US. But those are just, sorry to interrupt, those are just uh, for roles that are visible to the audience. So it might look good on screen if you see yeah. so many female characters. Uh, but if you look at um, the number of directors, the number of producers, the numbers of editors and camera people, sound, all those different roles, uh, the situation is quite, quite different. Uh, different. Um, so in addition, uh, we, uh, we look also at budgets and at distributors and broadcasters involved in different uh, um, programs um, to see yeah, what, the, what the division is there and what the, what the patterns are, basically. How far along are you in this research currently? And is there anything anyone listening maybe can help with? Is there anything still affecting the work? Do you have full access to what you need? How is that going? Well, we, um, we decided to try and work with the uh, sector as much as possible. So we've been kindly provided with a lot of data from the Netherlands Film Festival, from the Documentary Festival, ITVA, and uh, from the Film Fund. And that's been really helpful, but they're not complete because due to uh, privacy regulations, they're not allowed to share any data on uh, films that have not been selected or programs that have not been selected for these festivals. Uh, so we we know what we're missing that we're missing something. We we don't know what we are missing exactly. So that's a bit of a, a puzzle still. We're about midway now. Um, and uh, apart from just getting the numbers, another thing we want to do is a network analysis. We want to see who is collaborating with who, and what kind of uh, clusters are visible there. And what happens if you take certain nodes out of the network, certain people out of that network? Um, and that's been inspired by work that's been done in um, Australia, Germany, and Sweden, where they did um, those uh, network analysis and also uh, did some tests about uh, how can we change the dynamics in that network. And long story short, um, there findings suggested that it doesn't really help to just add more women into the network. It depends on where those women are in the network. Because if you just chuck them in, there's a risk of them uh, just staying in the periphery or working with other women rather than mixing with men. So their suggestion was that what really might help is to connect those women with uh, two powerful men, like uh, Deborah suggested, to, to make sure they're, they're being um, mentored. Um, and to really make uh, make that change within a network. So why is it important, important? Why is it important? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but why is it important uh, for for women to work with these men? What does it do for them? It makes them it makes them part of if you if you connect them to the men that are central in the networks, it makes them part of that central position. And if you don't do that, there's a risk that they will just keep floating on the edges and then you can't really change the system. Um, so you have to find a way. And of course, we have to see what the situation in the Netherlands is exactly. We have to, uh, to dig a little bit deeper, but um, we have to find ways to change the, dynamic, the dynamics within that network rather than just adding something uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the rims on the, in the periphery, because that won't really change um, um, the, the current practices. That makes sense. If I go back to the pipeline, it would mean you get to a certain point and then you'll just be waiting there on hold forever, uh, waiting for another lift. Um, thank you so much, Wilhelmin. Of course, we'll get back to you in a bit. I want to go to Bridget Oshia, founder of Documentary Association of Europe. Nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. 
May I just start? <laughs> yes, Would you like to ahead. ask a question? <laughs> I have a question, but if you want to just start, then go go ahead. <laughs> um, so I just uh, I just just would like to um, point out a couple of things that actually link also to Villamine's um, statements and also can build on maybe the resources that um, Deborah was also mentioning in her slides and on her um, screen. And so the first um, thing is that probably based on Movies That Matter being a festival in Europe, there's a lot of European people watching this session today. And so as Biliana already mentioned, she, meant, she talked about the association, the European Women's Audiovisual Network. They are also in connection with the um, academics that Villamine just mentioned, um, have uh, completed two studies on the status of directors, women directors in the European film market, which might help you um, help our audience have some access to data about um, the, the state of the European market, which um, as Deborah also said, is maybe like in a better shape than other markets, but that doesn't mean it's in good shape. Um, and then the other thing that I think is important to say is that gender discrimination actually knows no gender. So there are women who are just as terrible perpetrators of sexual um, uh, or as of, um, let's, no, let's just, not say. Uh, we're just as awful to each other as uh, men <laughs> are to us. But what, but what I want to say is we're all part of the system and the system is um, patriarchal and it's capitalistic at its core, which means that people participating in the system, whether they're a man or a woman or how they identify with gender, especially if they're in power places in that system, need to be held to the same accounts. So just because you're a man means that you're capable absolutely of feminist and employing feminist structures inside of your workplace whether that's as a distributor or as a funder. And as a woman, you need to be held to the same standards. So that's why I kind of, I don't wanna say I take issue with the idea that you have to surround powerful men with more women, but what you really need to do is just challenge, you know, the most powerful players in the industry, no matter if they're men or women, with people who have um, feminist thinking. And the feminist thinking can be embodied in all kinds of um, physical forms. And if you are really interested also in, in that idea, then I would really also like to recommend maybe as like reading um, as a follow up for this session for people in the audience, the PhD that you can find just by Googling um, the title of it. It's called This Work Isn't For Us, which is by a, a seminal feminist called Gemma Desai. And her work really, um, I would say, unpacks the biases um, that inform the European film, film market and European film system that does um, not allow for gender parity or racial parity or um, religious parity inside of the European film market at this time. So don't feel like disempowered by these numbers and like there's no way to beat it or defeat it because actually there's a huge um, movement at the moment to try and change things. But again, it has to be, I think, looked at, especially in the, the context of Europe from like this intersectional approach that's really not just about like having 50-50 equality because especially in the European context, sometimes those statistics can be really um, uh, like false friends. You know, they don't actually reveal what the, real, um, what the real issues are that are happening inside of the European context also to support Willemin's uh, statements. Yeah, that makes sense. And I can uh, see Willemin uh, on my screen nod to everything you, you say about these figures as well. Can you repeat the, the title of the research that we can look up later? Sure, the researcher, her name is Gemma Desai and the PhD is called This Work Isn't For Us. Okay, so that's a nice gift to our audience to uh, look up later. And um, then I wanna go to Iris Dummert's map. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I don't ask questions, I just let you all talk. <laughs> what, what are your first thoughts? Oh, what are my first, I'm thinking a lot actually. Um, I knew the situation was not so good, but I was a bit shocked by the numbers Deborah showed us and it made me realize there's a lot of work to do. And I work in documentary, I'm a documentary producer. And as everybody says in documentary, it's not that bad. And probably it's not that bad as in other uh, 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 parts of, of the film industry. 
but still, um, if we look at the big films, you know, the big selling films, also in the Netherlands, it's mainly uh, uh, feature films, but also documentary. It's mainly male directors. And also the, the, the wage inequality, how do you say this? Wage disparity, I think. The yeah. inequality in, in being paid uh, in between leading role of actor and actresses in the Netherlands is also, there's a big difference. So an actress as a leading, in a leading role gets less paid than an actor. So there's a lot to do and that's, can be, I think data is very important because with data you can prove and because now it's a feeling or a, or something you think, but with data you can go to to the foundations, to the funds, to the film fund. You can go to the festivals. You can go to the government or to the council of culture we have, and you can really show what the problem is and try to collect everybody to work together to improve the situation. On the other hand, I think it's also. Um, I don't know the English, but intrinsic or something in, in, inside of you as a, as a female that you have to yeah. change, you have to be aware. And you have to be aware of your own position and you have to be aware that it's not correct and that you have to change it and that you have to do it yourself also. You know, as a producer, yeah. um, I, are you aware of your approach towards the directors you work with? Uh, do you feel like we can translate the figures and the chances that women have and the way they even uh, knock on those doors. Do you feel like um, sometimes you need to have an extra eye on women and whether they're brave enough? I, I've, it's a bit of a strange question, but I, I think you get what I'm trying to yeah. ask. Yeah. Um, well, we how are... do you know how to value um, talent? Yeah, yeah. Um, eighty-five percent of our directors are female directors. So, and and we mainly work with female executive producers and producers. And I have to be really honest; it's not it. That was not our mission. It happened. Um, and I think it happened because of the type of films we want to produce. So um, maybe it's a female gaze or a female perspective, but. Yes, I think you have to, especially um, Deborah was talking about pitching and you have to team up. But what I see is that I need to help female directors or other uh, females working in this industry, help them a lot to get enough confidence to, to step out, to talk, to really uh, present yourself, being able to, to be representative. And on the other hand, uh, what I also see, but it's something different now, example with Corona that people are locked down, it's the females who take care of the children again. Although both men and women, women have the same, uh, same job, have a full-time paid job, the, the women take care of the children. So, um, and I also try, I always try to talk about that and to open, <laughs> open the yeah. eyes. It's that's that's also part of the system. But what, what you're saying it, this time affects women's position worldwide because of the natural position of taking care of the household, whether there's children or not, maybe even, um, which is an issue on itself. But at the other hand, I'm going to try to make it positive. Um, mm -hmm. Even before COVID, the last couple of years have really uh, made more stage for this topic and we've become so much more aware uh, also because of other revolutions that have been going on as Deborah mentioned in her keynote before um, yeah. and we are openly even discussing the fact that we need to value ourselves more as women within the industry. Um, is there a key there Buljana that you and the network that you've built have seen in the in these first few years maybe a growth um, in people's confidence the people you work with the women you uh, surround yourself with is there a confidence boost from the network that you've set up hmm. well um, definitely, but uh, we are also really very connected to European Women Audiovisual Network, Eva, 
that really set the standard in a way, even though we don't do the same things, but we really support each other and the existence of Eva, and I'm really proud to be among early members, uh, really um, had a big influence in my life. Uh, that is uh, that is really good example. But then concerning circle, uh, yeah, I mean, filmmakers, both producers and directors come with different issues and questions and uh, we make a mixed group so that we can uh, work on each other's issues with a, with a very um, um, up to the point experts uh, corresponding to their needs, but then also there are results. For example, last year in European markets, our alumni really got a big number of uh, industry awards. For example, first appearance award in ITVA was a project that was really developed to circle and that really developed towards uh, creative handwritings and uh, in the direction of author film. It's a film, uh, by Alina Gorlova, uh, the rain will never stop. And there are many more examples of this kind. So we see that this climate of confidence uh, where we know that we can reach out and ask forever we need and that we are there for each other and that we can ask other people is really very beneficial. So that is obvious, yeah. And Bridget, um... What kind of trends have you been observing um, these last couple of years? Uh, am I right when I when I say like uh, all the news surrounding us is actually benefiting our position slowly, at least in awareness? I mean, like I would say yes and no, to be honest. Again, not to be like terribly negative because I'm not, I'm actually very optimistic about the future. And um, so the Documentary Association of Europe, which is a new network for um, professionals working um, in all fields associated with nonfiction and filmmaking, was also only founded 12 months ago. Um, also, Biliana was one of our first members and Iris is also a member. So it's very nice to be together today. <laughs> um, it's always really exciting when something is so new and young to see like it's starting to appear other places than just in my dreams and imagination. But I think like the... The really important thing to remember here is this, this like quality question, you know, like this thing thrown around all the time. Deborah's probably heard it for the last 30 years of like, you know, oh, it's if women made better films or if women had more self-confidence or if this minority would only, you know, toe the cis white male fucking line, pardon my French, then everything would be better for them. It's fundamentally untrue. The system is built to like privilege and to celebrate certain um, members of our filmmaking community in the same way that most of the world is built based on neoliberal post-colonial white supremacist structures. This is like a fact. And when we all come to just agree that that's a fact um, and that it has usually, it's not usually a question of like work harder, be louder, be stronger, then maybe actually we could like dismantle a few of these really big blockages to the pipeline you know maybe then we could actually have more equity in um, the industry and I really like am so grateful for the work of the people who have come before me and I feel really lucky that as an immigrant living in Europe and as a woman that I can have a job that is somewhere really at the top of the European power structures I'm really grateful for that but I really see it as my generation of like new coming people into these powerful positions to continue that work and to make sure that we don't, um, you know, appropriate these old power structures and power struggles in order to make our lives like easier and richer. And I also think it's really funny that like these um, people say to Deborah, like, oh, you know, once you reach gender parity, there won't be like a need for women make movies anymore. Cause this is like the worst it's like the worst neoliberal capitalist thinking because actually there's plenty of room for everyone and all we're doing is creating more opportunity. Like nobody loses out if you actually sort this diversity stuff out. But that, what you're just saying also sounds like the biggest fear of those stopping the change that Absolutely. other people will lose out. They will miss out on their opportunities and their positions 
uh, Iris, may I ask you, <clears throat> is there that tension in the Dutch industry or uh, in Europe where you work, where uh, maybe sometimes when women try to make place for themselves, uh, there's obstacles because of fear of losing a position from men? Yeah, I think that's that's very general. It's the same with immigrants. People think of immigrant, immigrants come to our country, I lose my job. Well, it's not like that. It's really not true. So uh, I think, yes, this is also happening a lot. But there's also, you wanted to keep it positive. I think there's also in the, no, not that you wanted to keep it positive, but it is yeah. important also to keep a positive uh, um, perspective. Also in the Netherlands, it's changing a lot. I mean, we have Margie de Koning as the female director now of Movies That Matter, who's doing a great job. Uh, Vanya from the International Film Festival Rotterdam, who's really... Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I have troubles pronouncing her last name, to be honest. And, uh, um, and like the Netherlands Film Fund, who made a very strong point now with inclusivity and inclusivity and diversity. So there's a lot changing. And if I see my 70 year old daughter, I see that things are changing, but still it's a very small group. But on the other hand, a small group can make a big wave. So bit by bit, I think things are, are, are getting better. So it's, I, I agree with Bridget. It's a yes and a no. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah. the progress we see on the outside, how can we assure that it's not just the nice picture of these institutions also having, women and other minoritized groups working for them. Wilhelmine, how, how do we uh, see the difference between the appearance and therefore those uh, figures and the actual change, change that is maybe harder to measure? How do we grasp that? Well, that, that's actually a good question because we're talking about structural change there and that's always way more difficult. And if, if I can just uh, quickly respond to what Bridget said before, uh, of course, I agree with her that it's really important to have people, male, female or anywhere uh, on that binary uh, with a feminist outlook, both in, uh, in telling stories and in, uh, in the way they mentor other people. Uh, at the same time, I, I'm convinced that um, numbers do matter. Um, the Gina Davis Institute has this, the tagline, if she can see it, she can be it. And in that sense, it's really important to, um, for young people, especially, especially to see uh, what their options are and to, to, rec to be able to recognize themselves and their ambitions and their dreams in what they see in popular media. Um, um, but uh, uh, yeah, indeed, those are structural problems um, that are very difficult to, um, uh, to change. I think, um, um, well, actually, to be honest, I don't really have the answer how, how, how to do that. But what is important um, for us is that we work together with the sector, that we uh, together try to, um, uh, to come up with ways to change it. So um, our, our plan is to... Um, uh, to use our findings, which we hope to present before the summer, um, to start a dialogue and really start discussions with different uh, stakeholders in the industry um, to, to discuss where are the problems uh, and how can we solve them or how can we change things? Because we do believe that change starts from getting those data and getting the figures and, um, and seeing where the problems are and where, where, they, uh, where they are most severe. And hopefully that will, I, I, I think, change has to come from within. So hopefully that will just start a process and we still need to be patient. It will take time, but hopefully that will start a process uh, towards change and improvement. I totally agree, especially like the, the greatest like um, asset that we have in the audiovisual sector across the sector, no matter which genre you're working in is of course storytelling. So we really have the abilities to partner with researchers and with people who can share this scientific data with us and then we can use our you know our greatest asset to amplify it and really one of the most um exciting elements of working for the network or participating in circle or being a member of eva um, is of course building allyship between different um different parties in the audiovisual chain because i also don't think that especially in like the the field of documentary like Possibly a lot of the um, 
the kind of discrimination that is occurring, you know, that doesn't allow us to have like parity in, in the field, either of like ethnic or, um, or gender parity is not because people are like evil and bad and want to keep us away from the resources that are rightly ours. These are really structural issues. And so I absolutely agree that academia and science is really like our most important partner in this, in this struggle. That makes sense. Iris, I can see you nod. <laughs> no, it's, it's very inspiring to hear all these women talk and it's, it gives me hope and also some more, more strength to continue. I mean, Biri and I are together in, in, in Frauen in Build, Women in the Picture, which is a, a foundation in the Netherlands, which we set up to improve um, the labor market position of women in, in the Dutch or the visual industry and also to, to fight for gender equality, of course. And it's a little step we, and we maybe can team up with um, Eva, <laughs> although we are not in, in a way or work together. And as you say, we have to collaborate and we have this, this narrative way of uh, storytelling, the storytelling way. Of working, uh, of working, which we can use. So that's why I was nodding, especially about the whole storytelling thing. Makes sense. Makes yeah. a lot of sense. <laughs> hey, if we envision the pipeline that we mentioned in the beginning, <clears throat> and we start from um, film schools, it, what what is there anything that you can think of uh, to any of you that we have to tackle from there on? Are there any gates or are there any fears of young women applying? I don't know. I don't want to, I'm, I'm making big statements, but I guess it's big. So I can let's go say for a it. word. I can say a word from my part of the of Europe, where yes, actually the number is very clear. We have an open calls and it's very tough selection process. And uh, traditionally, girls, women are more successful than men. So we don't have problem with number of, uh, of women in schools. We have problem once we are out of schools. And uh, after a couple of years, there you, you, start, you start to really feel a big discrepancy. Uh, when, you maybe, when, you, when you come to talk about access to funding and again, differences about funding. And like, so what, what could be changed at least where there is not this kind of problem is like the general discourse is very toxic still. What, what happens um, there? So let's say I am positive, but let's not talk about that then. There's enough issues considering going to film school, getting into film school, staying in film school, getting out of there, being noticed when you just graduate. And then we get what you just mentioned. What happens there? But Why then is you it harder? Go, then you, for example, in I can tell you in Serbia, which had the different trends over the past 10 years, but at the moment is a, is a tricky one. Then you go and you apply for funding for your first film and you have commission of five members, all men, mm. all nice men. <laughs> and uh, they're just not interested, even if they're nice, they're not interested in, your, in, in the stories that interest at least the half of, uh, of world uh, population. And to, not to talk about minorities and like we, I can include that uh, when, when it comes to Balkan. So that's one point to tackle. And as Iris mentioned, maybe in the Netherlands, there's change happening uh, at the fund, at our main fund, the film fund. But uh, what you're saying, Biljana, is that there's still struggle in uh, representation in those gatekeeping positions. Right? Yeah. You ask me? Yes, yeah, I yeah, that, definitely. That is one thing, and then the the other thing is also the ways of dealing with the things and the uh, power gains and all kind of things. I, I, it's it's endless. I also, I, I can't, I can't like support support Biliana's statements enough because there's also the great thing actually about about being in a large market like Germany or um, 
or being an EVA member is that you do have access to these studies. And so there is really, there's really, really conclusive data on, um, on discrimination in the audiovisual sectors. And so I don't feel this is the case. I know it's the case. I know that graduate, the graduating number of women, especially from director, directing programs in Europe is more than 50% more than of graduates are women. It's not much more, it's like 51 or 2%, but more women are graduating from film school than they are from men. And so that means that the structural um, ba uh, barriers that they face are post-graduation. And then um, a, a really, there's a new CEO. So Germany is a federal system. So we have like a national film body, but actually most of our work is happening on a state level. So you're working with state funds and state broadcasters. And even yeah. if you're co-producing outside of Germany, you still need to have that state support in place really. And so there's a new, di new director of one one of the state film funds, which is the film fund in Hamburg, which is a smaller fund, but like very impactful and also very supportive of documentary filmmaking also and independent filmmaking in general. And um, he, he says that he's seen an improvement in the data of um, who is being supported at a development and production level already, simply by changing the selection committees of film funds. So if you have a selection committee of a film fund who represents society around us more generally, then they're more likely to support filmmakers who represent society around us. And that's generally. why it's so important to change those positions every few years. Absolutely. Uh, but I would make... also, yeah, I would also just one last thing, like I would also say that like audience development is also really important because again, like Mafia and, um, and, uh, and Deborah, Deborah we're saying we're saying these anecdotes like I also have them you know I was so inspired by the U.S. soccer team women's soccer team who were demanding equal pay and I was like with my woke Berlin international English speaking interconnected feminist um, uh, appearing friendship circle like having a beer saying like how amazing this like this um, the progress is and what like inspiring women they are, et cetera, et cetera. And two of them said to me that watching women's soccer on television isn't as exciting as watching men's soccer. Like, wow. what is that for a statement? That's just, it's crazy. It's the same thing. There are people on the field, they chase the ball around for 90 minutes. I don't know what happens there. I'm usually only there to like laugh at people and, and drink beer during the day. But like, there is for me no difference. But again, like the if you again this question of representation of like you know never never about us without us you know like the, the media is so permeate, permeating and for the last 150 years of um, audiovisual history we've been fed certain messaging that needs changing and unpacking and a lot of us just need help to yeah open our minds and and to know how to value uh, each other as equals mm -hmm. i have a question for Wilhelmine, uh, I'm just gonna read it out. <clears throat> Do you see a difference in the male-female balance in upcoming filmmakers at the start of their career versus the established film industry? When funders, for instance, would be more open to newcomers, would you expect more women who would naturally enter the industry and the professional filmmakers makers community more. Thank you, Rineke van Sante. So do you see a difference in the female male balance in upcoming filmmakers at the start versus the established industry? I think this is about hope also. Yes, and that is very important. And it's a good question. Uh, unfortunately, we're not researching that right now. It's definitely something that's on our list of future projects to look at. Um, uh, trajectories of people who've gone through uh, film academies or other um, formal and informal kinds of uh, um, routes of education and, and how their careers proceed. Um, but what this does refer to, and which is an important to, point to make, I think, is that there is a general lack of gender disaggregated data. So there's just a lack, there's a lack of data in general, but there's a lack of data when it comes to men versus women uh, as well. And of course, data are a kind of simplification of reality. So we look at men versus women and we are not really able to look at anything in between right now. Um, but, but we need more data that actually look at the, the, the numbers for men and women. Um, and often the data are just put on one single pile and then uh, uh, it, it's much harder to, of course, draw conclusions. So that is also why we are 
uh, or we need to spend so much time in this project to, to collect and, um, uh, and process uh, our own data because they're not readily, readily available. They're just not collected. Um, so we also hope to start um, a process where um, collecting data is more of a matter of course and where data are gender desegregated so that we can work with them in the future. That's nice. Thank you for the answer, uh, Rineke. I hope uh, this, you're happy. And otherwise, <clears throat> in a few minutes, when we go back uh, to the whole of the session, there's going to be a screen and you're going to scroll down. On, uh, there's a screen already where you're watching and you're going to scroll down and then you can go pick one of the tables and maybe continue your conversation. Uh, Rineke. So uh, please, everyone, stay with us. I think it's a nice moment to bring back uh, Deborah and Marche. I'm not sure if Marche is busy in the building or she's here. Um, you've been listening to our conversation. Um, uh, I've seen you nod every now and then, Deborah. I've seen you think. Um, yeah. Debra, first words, uh, did we get any further down that pipeline or are we still looking at it? I think there's so many, so many interesting things that, that were said. I, I have to say that I'm still, I'm still thinking about things that Bridget said, particularly about women and um, about how bad women can be. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 don't misunderstand. No, I, no, I understand. <laughs> I have, to, I, have to, I have to tell you all a little anecdote because I'm just full of anecdotes today. Um, but it also, it, I don't know. Has anybody seen Promising Young Woman? Okay, so it's nominated for an Academy Award. It is an amazingly feminist film. I mean, just shockingly, shockingly feminist. And um, I'm really thrilled that it's nominated. And I'm also thrilled that Nomadland is nominated. They're both made by women directors. They're so clearly, clearly, clearly films made by women directors, it's impossible that Promising Young Woman could have been made by anybody else. And this is actually just to support what you're saying, Bridget, but also to talk about it a little bit more. So it's a really complex film. It's a horror film, it's a comedy, it's a very serious film. And I listened to some critique of it on a podcast and they got it all wrong, just mm -hmm. so wrong. And then I listened to an interview with the filmmaker and I, I, it bolstered my opinion that they got it all wrong. So I decided I'm going to try to listen to or, and read every single, as much critique of this film as possible because I really want to see who gets it and who doesn't. And there's all these young women, very interesting young women that have podcasts on um, Two Chicks, Flicks Chicks, Chicks Flicks, <laughs> you know, critiquing women's, uh, critiquing all films, not just women's films. And they all got it wrong. <laughs> but there was one that was the, the, the film guys, guys, G-U-Y-S in English. And it was two men and a woman. And the woman did the most amazing case of, of ripping the film apart because it wasn't fair to men. And the one scene that she liked was the one scene where the main character is blaming a woman. Like the only time in the film where she's blaming women for what's going on. It's, it's about rape culture. The film is about rape culture. And it's about the, it's a revenge fantasy film by a woman about rape culture. I don't want to give anything away, but that's what it's about. Anyway, it just made me think so much. And, you know, I, I don't remember if it was Iris. I think it was Iris Williman that said, I think it was Williman, that talked about why it's so important for there to be more women working in institutions. Because yes. I think what happens to those women is they are part of the structure, you know, absolutely part of the structure, but they're part of a structure where there's, it's so dominated by men that as single women in the room, quote unquote, there's this whole notion of single women in the room, it's even harder for you to make change. You know, it's yeah. like being the minority and being the only person that can say this is racist, right? Because you're the or, minority in the room. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's so, but, I, you know, I just didn't want anybody to walk away thinking that this notion or somebody said like women can be really bad. Yeah. No, but it, it's, it is so much 
the structure of it all, as you were saying, Bridget. Exactly. You know? um, exactly. And it's important for us to so remember I, that because, sorry, I just want to say one last thing is that no, because, <laughs> no, be, be, because somebody also said, you know, women are constantly being told that they don't have enough confidence. You said it, that the women don't have enough confidence. And it's true what Iris said, that we need to help women to have more confidence. And it, sometimes women don't have confidence and sometimes men don't have confidence. I just can't take this blaming, blaming the victim, you know? Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly, exactly what I was trying to say. And so like, I've been lucky because actually I've been surrounded for the majority of my career by like wonderful women mentors of um, who I'm so grateful for. But I think what I would like to remind us all is that like internalized misogyny is something that also that both men and women have. And I have to fight mine every day. Every day I'm having like a discussion with myself about it and every day about like how I fit into the world. And this is really an ongoing process for us as we do come to terms with things like the Me Too movement, Time's Up, Black Lives Matter, et cetera, et cetera. You know, like what kind of world do we want to live in? And that's why for me, I think like if we could get away from this battle of the sexes mentality, you know, of like it's men versus women, then actually we can, I think we can go further in the sense of it's feminists against the patriarchy. That's where I'd like to be. I'd like to be feminists against the patriarchy. And who's in the, bo which body you're in is like, as they say in German, scheiße egal. It doesn't it's matter. It's not though. I'm going to so disagree with you. I want to give you a statistic. I'm going to give you a statistic. Go for it. I just, I, something that I, I had written down these other things that I didn't actually talk about, but um, independent films still employ more than, twice as many men as women, 68% yes. versus 32%. But if there is one woman, just one woman, in one of the six key roles of producer, editor, cinematographer, director, and executive producer, the film is twice as more likely to have women in those positions. Do you see yes. what I mean? Women I bring women along. And I'm sorry, there is, sorry, that's the, yes, there are women that have internalized misogyny. We've all internalized misogyny. But I still, still, still think that there is a big difference between the way that women see the world and the way that men see the world. And what women bring to almost any situation is going to be better for women than what most men bring to the situation. Well, I, did, I don't disagree with you. I also don't disagree with you on any level at all. In fact, I think I know, but it's two approaches to the same, to really the same thing. Because I also, I, I just think that there has to be space in there for gender fluidity. You know, there has to be space in there to get to move away from the binary. And that's, that's the part that for me sometimes feels an exclusive space for um. For people, I, yeah, I try to practice non 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 uh, exclusion, but I don't disagree with you, and I 100% agree with you. And I would say 99.9% .9 of the professional opportunities that I've had in my career have come from women. Yeah, you know, I'll just there's one other story that I usually tell that I think Deborah, this, is, this is going to oh, be sorry. the story that we wrap up with uh, oh. because okay. it's already past time, which no, 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 I don't no, really I don't care about. Um, yeah, but tell the story. Tell us the story. story. If if Marge gives us permission, then we can just stay course. here. Tell that story. Nobody wants to miss that out. No, you know, because it, I, we could go on for so long about about the difficulties in getting rid of the binary when you're talking about the representation of women. It's really complicated, but I will never forget hearing Spike Lee speak many years ago. And he was talking about uh, the fact that he was really upset because Sidney Pollack was going to make this film about Malcolm X. And somebody from the audience said to him, does that mean that you can only make films about uh, black people, that you can't make films about white people? And he said, no, it's not the same because I have had to live in a white dominated world and I have to know white culture in order to exist. Black people, uh, white people do not live in a black world and they do have no, no idea of what it is to live in a black world. And I feel like it's very similar with women. That, And when I'm speaking about women, I'm talking about the socialization that we undergo as women, which is, is part of what complicates that notion of gender fluidity, um, but not. Because if you grow up and you are socialized and you live in the world as a woman, then you're gonna bring that to the table. 
So I'm saying two things, out of, as you say, out of two sides of my mouth, but I think that that is in fact what we all are confronted with. Uh, that, was, that story was definitely worth hearing and it's definitely something that's gonna stick with all of us. Marcia, any final remarks? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I, I was quietly listening to the conversation and I'm just, there's going a lot through my mind. There's going through my mind when I first was, uh, let's say, the big boss at the, in, in my small broadcast and could, could do things. I had a poster on my wall saying, men do the right things and, and women do things right. Slightly, a, a little nuance, which meaning that we, we if I if I zoom out and I understand what Bridget is saying and what Deborah is saying, what the others are saying, but it's it's I think um I've raised by a father and he always said you have to um uh, educate your children or educate by living. Uh, uh, for the Dutch people, for life. You have to practice what you preach constantly by by doing so. And that's not always easy. And I think what if I can talk from my own experience when I was teaching at university having three small kids that was the first thing I always said for the women in the house the filmmaker women in the house I'm a yes I'm a mother of three but I make films and I do these things and that's hard work but it's also um I feel with Deborah but I also feel with with Bridget in the way that I think um we just bloody hell got to do it and be so uh, 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 uh build that solidarity thing with with all the women Absolutely, and with that educated um, uh, 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 male, a man. I mean, I left the public broadcast, as you, a lot of you know, so maybe not, two years ago as a commissioning editor, and it's a very comfortable position. And I really felt, amongst other reasons, that I had to give it to somebody else, that you have to refresh. It's good that the Dutch Film Fund is refreshing itself and people getting, and, and realizing that other people should get in other places, etc. So... We as women have to be really uh, uh, solely there together, of course, but we also have to educate these men and, and women like Deborah and me who are around the block for so long. I'm 57 now. Uh, um, uh, I, 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 I absolutely will keep on picking on that glove and I feel very responsible for that, for the younger generation to do so. And that's... And, 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 well, the, the ones who know me, uh, I will challenge it whenever I can and I will keep on doing that. And I hope uh, with us that we do this, we should maybe get this panel. Now it's at our festival. I can do it next week again because we're all in the Zoom. It's fantastic. And um, and yeah, hold each other's hands in that and support, maybe, maybe. And then we have to shoot the pipeline to the films of Deborah. <laughs> To the Oscars, who know, very, very important. We're going to talk to that about on Wednesday with Maite and Julie uh, Goldman. Maite, Alberti and Julie Goldman. On the, they're telling how the mall agent uh, got from a small film to the Oscars. It's going to be, we, we pre-recorded this. It's going to be hilarious. You have to see that. It's really cool. And um, but there's there are many women in 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 all continents in the world uh, having devastating uh, uh, situations where they make films about, and we have to support them as much. Go and watch now if you still oh you can't, but you can watch mothers, watch dying two d fours, watch that kind of films. Absolutely, don't forget. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Deborah for tuning in. Thank you, Biljana, Willemien, Bridget, Iris. Thank you, Margie. And also thank you, Creative Europe Nederland, for hosting yeah. this session. Yeah, thank you all so much. Yeah.